Well, I'm very glad to be doing this early on so that I can sit back and listen to the rest of you guys uh, presenting and, and doing your panels. Um, if you didn't already see, um, my name's Iman Amrani and I'm a journalist at The Guardian. Uh, and I was asked to come here because I did a YouTube series on modern masculinity for The Guardian. And um, I took a slightly different approach to what I thought think people were expecting from us. Um, let me just start at the beginning. The first question everyone asks me is, why would a woman do a series on masculinity? And uh, there are so many layers to that, but I'll go down the professional line, which is um, I always found myself drawn to issues and interests around male-dominated spaces, be that music and hip-hop or football or uh, terrorism because of the identity question in that. Um, and I covered the Bataclan attacks, Charlie Hebdo, uh, the uh, attacks in Belgium, the attacks in the UK as well. And so I did all of those things quite intensively in the communities where these young disillusioned men were. And I could see these patterns between these different countries. And when I was covering uh, drill music and knife crime in the UK, this was a completely different community and it was also a very male-dominated space. And I was seeing lots of other kind of similarities. And then when I was looking at what was going on in the United States with the, uh, the shootings, the so white supremacists, um, and not just white supremacist people who were you know, in the cells and had like, different motivations, but were predominantly white, I was seeing that there were yet more kind of similarities with these kind of disillusioned, disenfranchised, angry men who on an extreme had presented that anger with extreme forms of violence. So I had this kind of interest there already. And then um, back in 2017, the other thing that triggered me to want to do this uh, series was the Me Too movement. So when the Me Too movement started, it was quite clearly about abuse of power. Um, and I think there were really clear kind of objectives and motivations of what it was in the first instance. But as it moved on, I identified with a lot of my male friends that they just felt uncomfortable being part of the discussion um, and debate around Me Too. In fact, they felt like it wasn't a discussion or debate and that it couldn't be participated in. They were supposed to sit there and listen to women's experiences, which obviously, you know, there's, I have a lot of time for that. But you reach a point where there has to be a dialogue and there has to be a true and honest and open dialogue where people can say things that are uncomfortable. And I was looking around me and I was seeing that the conversations were happening in, you know, in like online spaces or, you know, in the living rooms or... And these were people who I was around who are great thinkers, they're, they're very intelligent, and they were too scared to say what they really thought around uh, the grey areas of Me Too. So I'm talking about later on when it went on to Aziz Ansari and Junot Diaz and the writers and the comedians, where it, it just got a bit more complicated. It wasn't so black and white. Um, and I just thought... For myself, I feel so frustrated going round and round in the same conversation. I just felt like it made me feel like I wasn't doing anything as a, as a journalist who is interested in kind of pushing boundaries and being curious and stepping out of my own bubble. So I wanted to take the conversation somewhere else and try and talk to men who potentially had very, very different experiences and social bubbles to myself because that is what made me want to be a journalist in the first place. I could sit around and write about my vagina or my, my own identity, you know, from behind a desk, and that I could make a career out of that. But that's not why I wanted to be a journalist. So um, I started this whole journey at the kind of sharp end of the debate, shall we say, and I decided to get completely out of my Guardian liberal bubble in London and go to a Jordan Peterson event in Birmingham. Uh, a, a few people I work with really did question that. They were like, why are you going to a Jordan Peterson event? And I thought, you know, there's so much journalism where people, um, they get all of their information online, they get all of their information from, you know, threads, um, and there, there's only one type of person, I think, or a few types of people who comment online, and there are loads of kind of quiet observers who watch the videos, but they don't leave any comments. And you, don't, you only find them when you step outside and you meet them at the event. So I went to a Jordan Peterson talk and I was really surprised because having read what I'd read about him online and having seen the Kathy Newman interview on Channel 4, I thought I was going to be walking into like a really, really hostile 
space for someone like myself um, and that it might be quite difficult to approach people. But it turned out every person that I approached the event described themselves as left-leaning and a lot of the men described themselves as Corbyn supporters and one guy even described himself as a Marxist and I thought it was really interesting. I said to them, why have you come to this event? Like, what makes you want to come to see Jordan Peterson? And quite a few of the guys I spoke to said, well, it's not that we agree with everything he says. We just like that the space feels like a space where there's no fear. There's no fear of political correctness. You can talk about whatever you want. And I thought that was really interesting because a lot of the spaces which I've been around on, let's say, the left, the liberal left, um, I felt like, yeah, that, that openness for discussion is quite limited. Um, and I felt more recently, much more recently, in a kind of a unique position as a woman to be able to say, actually, I do want to open a dialogue and I do want to hear what you've got to say. And I don't actually get anything out of shutting down this conversation. So I met this guy called Neil at the event. Uh, Neil, um, he was a fascinating guy. He had all these face tattoos and looked quite aggressive. But I grew up in a hyper macho um, household, so I wasn't very scared of him. I went over and started chatting to him. And he actually looked, seemed more intimidated by a five foot three woman approaching him, because I don't think he's used to that. Um, and we had a conversation about masculinity and he, um, he invited me to go and, and speak with him in Leeds. Um, and I think, just to pull it back a second to talk about Jordan Peterson, there are lots of things that he says that I, could, that I do completely disagree with, but I feel like a lot of the time when I've seen people focus on what Jordan Peterson talks about, they talk about the kind of more fringe comments he makes or the side points and there's been a lack of engagement with the core principles of responsibility and meaning which is it's continually repeated in all of his work and I found that fascinating I found that really interesting because of the work that I had done you know around extremism and the work that I had done around like you know knife crime and this anger that I was talking about earlier I really felt that there was this loss like this kind of lost sense of self lost sense of meaning this the anger comes from somewhere because there's a void, right? And I just thought, oh, Peterson's making this point that I'm not really seeing made anywhere else. Or if it's made, it's not packaged in a way which has the reach that he has had. So for all of the criticisms that he gets about the way he speaks, um, for example, on like the role of women, he has quite traditional ideas about the role of women and men. I actually thought, you know, the engaging with the, the deeper ideas that he's had could be quite valuable. And a lot of the criticism that he's had um, has failed to offer alternative solutions. So uh, when I was speaking to Neil, the main points that kept coming up was, um, you know, the idea of responsibility and meaning. And Neil had had a, a really intense upbringing. He had grown up in a Mormon family in Scarborough. Uh, he had been abused as a child and he'd attempted suicide. And he'd gone through, you know, all of the most horrific kind of phases that you know, had affected the men that were approaching me about this series. We did a call out on The Guardian and asked people what they wanted us to talk about. And he'd kind of gone through every extreme situation uh, to the point, actually, where when he was 19, his um, father, who had been adopted and grew up in foster care, his father rediscovered his family and then ran away with his own sister, who he hadn't known growing up. So this guy, Neil, who had gone through all of these difficulties... When he was 19, his dad ran away to be with his aunt, and it was all over the news, and it was just a massive story. We actually, obviously, had to fact-check that, and we found all of the tabloid reports on that, and it was really such an interesting story. But he said that what Peterson had done was effectively help him to find a direction in his life. And I thought that was fascinating when you look at this question of religion. He stopped being a Mormon, and then he had this void, and then what do you fill the void with? And I think... That is a really common question across the board, regardless of your race or your, you know, your background. The, the issues facing the, well, if we look at the backgrounds of the, the jihadis who committed the Bataclan attacks, they're not people that have grown up with religion, they're people that have grown up in the care system, they're people who have been radicalised in prison, they're people that didn't have a sense of you know, spirituality or faith, you know, they were involved in crime before. And I found it fascinating that there was this kind of hunger to find meaning and purpose. Um, 
So yeah, I'm going to show you a little bit of this thing with Neil to see what you guys think. Where am I going to start it from? One second. So uh, I think that Neil was just such a fascinating character. Like I said before, he kind of embodied all of these things which I think are, you know, the main components of this crisis of masculinity which we talk about. Um, and he was just a guy that I found at a Jordan Peterson event. And I did find that by just going and with an open mind, knowing what, you know, I know what the Jordan Peterson debate is. I know what Jordan Peterson talks about. I've obviously done my research. So I know all of the things that are, are around him, but I went with a really open mind of, okay, I'm going to try and just listen. I'm not going to present the other side. I'm not going to present to him, you know, oh, well, people say this about Peterson. I questioned why it was different, and I actually got a really interesting answer. Um, and, and it was a genuine question, so I think that that was actually why I got such an interesting answer. And I think that a lot of the time now, when I look at questions of masculinity, and Peterson has now become, you know, such a kind of leader on the issues of, you know, masculinity in this crisis, um, you know, if that's what we want to call it. Um, when you look at it now, it feels like things are so politicised and people respond so tribally to things that there's just this lack of kind of willingness to engage with ideas that have come from the other side. And I think that that central thing of like purpose and meaning was so important. That I don't think that, you know, people can afford to let that be, uh, you know, the, the kind of property of just Jordan Peterson or, on, you know, people that, who are, I guess, politically on the right and seem to be now like the defenders of men. I think that this is such a, a broad issue that we should be able to engage with these questions and not have to feel like we have to bring up every single, you know, other argument and I guess make it so, um, so unclear to come towards any solutions. I mean, masculinity is complicated as it is, let alone overly politicising it. Um, so yeah, so this was my second episode that I did um, and I found that the response was overwhelmingly positive. I think people were really surprised, especially because I work for The Guardian. I, I'm not just saying that. The comments all say I would, didn't expect this from The Guardian. And I found that quite depressing um, because I hadn't compromised on any values. I actually, my values are to be really open and curious. And um, so I felt that that was a shame that that was the kind of impression that people had. And I think it's really important that as journalists, we kind of provide people with interesting life experiences and information that, you know, feeds the curiosity that other people have as well. So um, in the next episode, um, I went on to interview a bunch of quite well-known men, um, a rapper called DWE, Jack Fowler from Love Island, uh, Emanike, who's another singer, Jon Snow from Channel 4 News, Vinay Patel, the uh, writer, and uh, Francis Rossi from status quo, um, yeah, that was really interesting because he's not of my generation at all. And he was really funny. Uh, Francis obviously couldn't stop talking about his penis and kept pointing out that he had a cock and I had a vagina. Uh, we didn't put any of that in the video. <laughs> had nothing to do with masculinity. Um, <laughs> but um, it was fun and, you know, got to hang out in his um, studio and it was kind of fascinating because He's of a different generation, and speaking to him about masculinity was just eye-opening for me, as it was to speak to um, Jon Snow. So when I was saying before, I could quite easily and happily, you know, for other people, write about identity and write about, you know, being a young woman of colour and being a Muslim. And I have written articles about things like that, but I just don't find it that interesting. I find it really self-indulgent and actually... I find that I grow more when I'm outside of myself and when I'm meeting other people. Um, and there was a particular thing that I'd like to show you from that uh, video. Can you see the word? Mind. Let me see, where is it? Let's see. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to show you from here. Yeah. This is my flat, and I look really scruffy as usual, so don't judge me. That was just to show like um, a range of the different men that I spoke to, and there were points 
I, 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 what I enjoyed so much about the series was having my own preconceptions challenged, right? Because um, it's just flipping the table a bit. And the points in that video, or doing those interviews, that challenged my preconceptions, and not all of these points made it to that cut, was Vinay Patel, who's the, the writer. He made a point about, well, I, when I said to him, what are the pressures you feel as a man? And he said to me that he felt a pressure from girlfriends to always kind of have a high sex drive and that because of his depression, he struggled with that. And I just sat there and thought, that's so interesting because I haven't really had to think about that. And he spoke about it in such detail. And I thought, yeah, I guess there is that stereotype. He said, you know, there were times when he didn't want to have sex with his girlfriends and they'd taken it really badly because they had this image of, you know, the guy's always supposed to be up for it. And it had really kind of taken a toll on his relationships. And, you know, I went away and I, I really thought about that. And he said he actually hadn't spoken about that before. And I thought, are you crazy? You just did that with two cameras there, but okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other one was, um, uh, oh, Francis Rossi, um, when he wasn't talking about his cock, um, talked about um, his relationship with his father. But another thing that didn't, I didn't put in the cut because we were, going to make, we were going to make a part two of it and we actually haven't done that yet. But he talked about how he thought he was quite a shit father because he had seen his role as basically providing for the family economically. So he'd been off on tour and his family had this huge house and he'd been paying all of this money because that's what he thought his role was as a father. And that he looked back on it now and he just felt like he hadn't been there at all for his sons. And I just, I thought that was really interesting because it's not very often that you get men, I think, finding it easy to openly describe their failures as, as parents. It's really difficult. So I really, and also Francis Rossi, he's got so much bravado that it was quite touching to, you know, see him let his guard down. Um, and similarly, Jon Snow, the point that he, he made that I was walked off thinking about was, we all know that abuse happens, but I guess in my bubble, it's not something that I think about frequently. And with that image of, you know, super privileged white men, there's never that room for those kinds of issues, right? Which actually have their own characteristics in private schools or in privileged, privileged places. And I just had to think about that, you know? I just had to kind of put that at the forefront of my mind when I was talking to him. And it does probably affect how I watch Channel 4 News now. But um, it was, yeah, it was just really interesting to have my preconceptions challenged. And I don't think that they would have made those points, those vulnerable points, which made me think if I had been aggressively pursuing some kind of line with them, I went into it really open-minded, and that, you know, it can be hard at points some days, you're in a bad mood, you're like, I'm gonna go do an interview with somebody, and you're just feeling a bit aggressive, <laughs> maybe. Um, and, you know, it was good to kind of, as a, per as a human, not just as a journalist, put myself in those spaces and have to open up. So, um, in doing all of this, um, I also was really careful in that openness not to use the word toxic masculinity because I think it's really charged. And I've had so many people come to me and say, oh, I've watched your series on toxic masculinity. And I find that really interesting because I'm like, why do you call it toxic masculinity? I never say that word. I'm so careful to never, ever say that word because I think it's like opening a can of worms. What does it mean? And it has a meaning, but I don't really want to address that because I'm trying to get to these points like what I've said about Jon Snow and Francis Rossi, and I want them to talk about that. I don't want to talk about language. I don't want to talk about, you know, the patriarchy. I know what that means. Where does that take me in terms of understanding somebody else's experience? So, yes, it's definitely not a series about toxic masculinity. So if we talk about it later in the weekend, please remember that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, and actually in the comments even, people wanted to debate toxic masculinity. There's something about that phrase that's just kind of grabbed people, um, and it's, it's kind of, it, it's mad. Um, but yeah, I think that in doing all of this, the big takeaway that I have from it is that we talk about this crisis, and I think there are lots of things which, you know, there's the, the extreme violence that I've spoken about, um, and I guess the, the high rates of suicide in men, and... Um, you know, even the fact that there are so many men that are kind of looking to YouTube videos to, to hear the voices that make them feel, you know, um, heard and, and like they belong to something. And that's really quite, can be quite terrifying, actually, if people would feel like they're not getting that space in real life um, or in the circles around them. Um, but 
I don't think that it's a completely depressing image. I think that when I went and spoke to people, I actually found that there were just so many interesting characters that had found answers and were working through solutions and had great things to say and great contributions to make, and they just needed to be given that space and to, to be asked and for that environment to be created where they knew that it was safe. And there's such a lack of trust with journalists in the media now, I think that really contributes to that kind of feeling of having a crisis because it's always pushed to extremes, whatever conversation you're having, it's like you've got to push it to one side or the other and that just continues to you know, make everything more fractured and more divided and then that's when you have this feeling of, uh, yeah, there is a crisis going on. When in reality, I think that there are quite a few, you know, glimmers of hope and possibility that we could work on. Um, so, yes, um, that is, well, yeah, and there were other episodes as well that I did later on, but um, one of them was with Football Beyond Borders in South London with a charity that works with young men. Um, I thought it was really important to go and speak to them because we often speak about young men. We have this kind of concern over knife crime and, and all of these things happening um, in these communities, but we never actually speak to the young men who are affected by that. So I did that um, in the fourth episode and the fifth episode, I spoke to an organisation called Band of Brothers where they get younger men to work with older men and we spoke about the, um, the intergenerational kind of divide and how community broken down a bit so younger men have less kind of mentors or uncles or people that they can go to for advice and to help give them life guidance and they're kind of trying to recreate that. And in the sixth episode I did a big roundup. So that's what I've done. Um, I found it really interesting. Um, it would be great if you know if you watch it to give any feedback. Um, and I'd also like to kind of open it up and hear what you guys think about the bits you've watched or um, yeah, any thoughts you might have because that's what I'm interested in. I'm actually interested in dialogue and hearing what other people have to say. So I don't know if you have the microphone. If anybody would like to make a point or ask a question or. Hi there. I was in interested. I was interested to um, to know whether you had any thoughts on class in this context, because I noticed, I think, that a lot of the men, maybe apart from Jon Snow, they came from more working class backgrounds, and whether or not you felt that there is a pressure on young men in those, in those kind of backgrounds that is different or maybe tougher than, than maybe more middle class backgrounds. Um, I definitely think that Coming from the background that I come from, I'm more aware of the pressure of class. I'm more aware of what's going on. I, I came in covering the issues um, affecting young men who are radicalised and knife crime because I could get access to those communities because I have a good understanding of how that works. And I do think that there is a pressure when you don't feel like you have opportunities in life, when you feel like there's not really a clear route of success and you're surrounded by people who are not doing anything particularly motivating and you feel that sense of hopelessness, right? I think that that's obviously going to contribute to, you know, feeling completely disillusioned. But like I say, when I did this, I actually found myself pleasant... Not ple pleasantly surprised isn't the right word. I did find myself going oh yeah, it's difficult for Porsche white guys too sometimes. And um, I thought that, but I thought that was really, that was actually really valuable um, to do. And I think, yes, it's much more difficult if you're coming from a working class background, of course, because, you know, there's just, there's less freedom. You can't just be like, oh, I need to get out of this environment. I'll just go outside and go to the countryside, you know, just to, or if you're in inner city, you know, inner city, Birmingham or London, whatever, you can't just go outside and like, um, do that thing where you, you recalibrate or you, you know, um, clear your brain. And if you have money and, you know, opportunities, you can, those simple things, I think, make a massive difference. Um, so, yeah, I do think class plays something in it. But I'm trying in all of this to open it up so that I don't come in with prejudices and, and try and make it um, too much about uh, identity um, from my opinion, projecting that onto something, if that makes sense. Are there other... Uh, that was fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. It's really interesting. Hello. Um, 
Great. I was, I, I was really interested in the relationship between you as an interviewer uh, and a teller of stories, essentially, and the people that you were working with. Um, firstly, whether you think that your identity as female, and possibly as a person of colour as well, or someone with your particular background, meant that not only do you have access to people, but whether that affects how open people will be with you, and whether actually, you had, if you had been a Jon Snow outline, whether a lot of the guys that you spoke to would have um, felt as um, like they could talk to you. I just wonder what, what gender does in that. Um, but also, uh, part two is um, whether it's something we're going to talk about later as, as writers and uh, theatre makers, how we bend our own identity in order to fit in with a group. And I thought it was quite interesting that you slightly change your diction depending on who you're talking to. Um, and how aware are you that you do that? And how much is it a sort of journalistic tool or is it also about getting on with people and forming a real relationship? I'll show you a video to answer that one. But um, the first question about being a woman doing this, um, I did get asked a lot, you know, why would a woman do this? Do you think a man could do this? Um, or no, actually, I got asked a lot, do you think a man could do a series on femininity? And I think a man could do a series on femininity, of course. I, I mean, yeah, if you approach it open as a, in the way that I did, you know, if you come to things open and you're not projecting... Um, I do think a man could do it on femininity. A lot of... So, a band of brothers, this organisation that works with um, younger men and older men, they have this uh, rite of passage in the forest. It's something they do. I think it's actually quite a lot of organisations do that now. Um, you know, this rite of passage. They say we've lost this kind of traditional thing of, like, becoming a man, from being a boy to being a man. And that all happens in the forest, and it's all very secret, and women aren't allowed to go. So, um, I couldn't go along to that. That was totally fine. I don't mind. You know, I like doing... There's moments where I want to be all with women and we do our own thing and, yeah, okay, it can happen both ways. And that didn't stop us having a great conversation. But some men said, oh, it's different. If there's a woman there, it changes the dynamic. And what I did notice was when I was one-on-one -on -one with men or there was a small group, I think that um, I've got quite a non-threatening presence. So like I'm quite short. It might have a big personality, but I'm quite short. And... Um, also, um, I guess I'm not super imposing, but I'm quite friendly, so that made things easier. And I think Jon Snow said at one point, he said they liked talking to women because he felt like they weren't in competition with him in the way that men were, and that they were always kind of trying to one-up each other a bit. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because I really didn't care to one-up anyone I was speaking to. Um, it just didn't even occur to me. Um, so there is that, uh, which I think it worked in my favour, but it could have worked a completely different way. I think another, another woman might have a different approach and not be received in the same way. I work really hard to develop trust, and it's a genuine trust. You know, like I, There are things that people have said on camera, and I've gone, yeah, I think that's come across quite badly. And I don't think it would be a service to you who has trusted me to have this conversation for me to put that in the edit because I don't think that's a fair representation of who you are. Um, and so it, that's not about me being a woman. That's just about me being responsible and trying to build trust with the people I talk to. Um, so there's that. And then you asked about the accent. I actually do answer that somewhere. So let me just find that um, video. <coughs> Cool, there you go. It's so embarrassing to watch that back because I don't even think I've been speaking to. Be, I speak to Americans. I do an American tang. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's absolutely <laughs> vile. So yeah, apologies, but I get really good quotes out of people when I do that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, there's three. Do you have any ideas about how to, um, through your kind of work and research, how to broaden that safe space? So it feels like obviously that conference is a kind of maybe slightly more on the extreme side of things, and that's why they found that space, safe space. But how, if we're, you know, there's this void, I'm interested in how that might become more mainstream. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's a cultural thing, I think, at this point, um, because, I mean, we've talked about identity in a number of ways. I think political identity is fascinating, and it's like, it feels like there's a script, I think, on the left a lot. I feel like it, it's the identity politics which obviously I'm really interested in. There are, there are aspects of it where I go, actually, I'm so kind of tired of the same conversations happening and the shutting down, the cancel culture, the non-platforming, all of that stuff. I just think that is what has made it's so difficult for people to... That's what you need to do. You need to break that down. How do you break that down? I don't really have an answer for that because it's so widespread now. It's in, you know... Like when you go to... My sister's at SOAS, and I walk into SOAS, and I'm like, this is so interesting... Because they have all of that stuff. That's like that's like just the kind of bolt board of that kind of culture. And I find it fascinating because I'm like, you are all super privileged kids who are kind of being really performative with all of this, acting like you really care about like the average man when really you've made the entire conversation about linguistics and about, you know, you have to understand all of these words and codes and everything. It's like another way of making it super exclusive and you can't just open that conversation up. And then when you go out and speak to just random people in the street, they're not talking like that. And so I think it's difficult if you've got in universities and in the media and in politics, this kind of straight jacket on where you can't say this, you can't say this, you can't say this, you've got to say this, and it's all, everything's got this kind of binary, you're either on the good side or the bad side, you're either on the right or the left. Of course people don't feel safe to say what they think because most people have complicated ideas that come from their own personal experience which isn't straight up and down and it's very subjective. So I'm not sure if I completely answered it, I'm kind of saying it's really hard. Yeah, I think I think what struck me about how your style was sort of compassion, um, and I think it feels like there's also a crisis in empathy and compassion. And if we can bring that into the mainstream somehow, then maybe those safe spaces might broaden. And but I, I just don't know how to do that. But I think that partially, and you know, it sounds nuts me saying this, having written about identity and working at the Guardian. But I think the identity politics thing, like looking at everything through the prism of your own experience. You know, this is about identity. I think identity is fascinating and it's something to be, you know, like looked at and challenged and kind of analysed and it's really, I'm so glad that that's the kind of, um, the theme of this year, it's fascinating to me, but it, so many people kind of try and find that identity and hold on to it and then, and then they won't let themselves see out, outside of that box, if that makes sense, um, I think that's really, really dangerous, really dangerous. So yeah, there was a question here and a question from Jake. Hello. Hi. Thank you for that. I thought it was wonderful. Um, well, your work that you're doing in general. Um, I wonder about um, self worth because often, uh, uh, well, watching this and often thinking about the relationships between men and women at the moment. Um, I wonder if it's a crisis in self-worth. I always feel like there's this um, kind of uh, self-help thing around women, like a man cheats on you, you work on your self-worth. There's this, this, there's this thing of building it, but we never really talk about men working on their self-worth. And I wonder if you feel like a lot of this comes from that, um, of not having ever been taught that, or to work on it, or to an, uh, have an idea of your own power as a man, that this is where this kind of comes from, or is, is bred from. And also, the other thing I wanted to ask, um, and it would be good to hear from some men on that subject, about their self-worth and their sense of their own self-worth. Because I feel like a lot of women are talking in this room. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is if you thought or had an opinion or an idea about the the. It seems to me as as women are redefining what their role is. It's creating it or has created for good or bad a crisis in then what a man's role is, and I feel like the more I get or we get further in a generation that I'm part of a generation that are really women who have their own careers, can buy their own house, can these kind of material things that men are always supposed to provide. It's now creating this kind of Jordan Peterson, whatever it is, because it feels like men are not quite sure what their roles are. 
which could also go into the self-worth. So I wonder if you felt like, or if you saw, that there was a correlation between that? Um, I mean, one thing I would say is I try not to project too much because even though I'm doing this talk, I, in the videos, um, most of the videos, I try and get the guys to say what they think and how they feel, and I just ask questions. So I would feel a bit like, it would feel a bit mm, not in the kind of line of what I'm trying to do to say too much on that. I think you're right, maybe, you know, if any men would like to speak. And also I think it's really hard to make massive generalizations. The self-worth thing is interesting, but I think it fits into the idea of purpose and meaning, because having a purpose gives you, like, gives your life a value, right? It gives you, a, a, it gives you, if you have no meaning, it, it's, and it's purposeless, it's kind of got no value, there's no reason to have it. So I do think those things actually link up a lot, and that's why, you know, loads of men have said that Jordan Peterson saved their lives and things like that, because he's given them a sense of purpose and self-worth and that they matter and that they can t take responsibility for things and even when things are really, really awful, that they're, they're, they're here for something, you know? That is a value, right? So I think those two things are really, really interconnected. Um, and you said something about the women's role. I think that's like, that is very much one of the key things that people say frequently is that, you know, with women um, kind of going out into the workplace and having um, contraception and, you know, the lifestyle changing, yeah, that's had a massive impact on men. And I think that's, True, but also I think it's down to um, the way the economy's changed, the work, you know, work for um, men who used to work in, in factories and things like that, and, you know, working class men, then not having, you know, the same jobs that they used to have before, and the jobs which gave them an identity as well, um, you know, back when there were miners and things like that, and all of that stuff I think contributes to it as well, and that's not about the women, that's about the role of men as well. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying it's our fault or anything. I no, 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 I know. I'm just kind of, course. from that idea, I think that is, that is true, but I think also it's just like everything else yeah. um, as well. So I think it definitely makes a difference. Of course it does. It does. Yeah. Uh, thank you, man. That was really wonderful. Uh, before Mike, Leslie will talk about self-worth um, on behalf of the fellowship. Um, I wanted to um, ask you about the sort of the positive forms that this search for meaning or purpose was taking. Because you, you mentioned it a lot, and it seems to be what drives you towards Peterson in the sense that he's talking about find your meaning, find your purpose. But what was the what were the sort of things that people were then talking about that gave them that that sense? Uh, what was it for men that that, that made them feel purposeful, meaningful? That was um, a really interesting question, because that's the obvious thing to say. It's like meaning, what does that even mean? Purpose, what, what is that? Um, and I guess most of the guys, I mean, Peterson does talk about this, but most of the guys I spoke to, like Neil said, it's your family. I think family was a big thing. It's like having connections with people in real life. Interestingly, most of the men I spoke to didn't find work in itself as the purpose, right? They, I think being in London, there's that impression that your work and your body of work, what you do, is your purpose. Um, but most of the men I spoke to outside, they were saying uh, their children, their relationship with their partners, um, they were saying things like having um, a role to do good in the world, like to, to kind of um, contribute to the community. And when I spoke to people later on, not about Peter kind of like, wasn't supposed to take over everything, but then uh, it's kind of hard to avoid him when it comes to masculinity. But later on, I spoke to men who were just trying to recreate those spaces in real life away from social media, because I feel like so much of this happens online. People watch videos, they share videos, they're on Twitter, they're on social media, and they're on Facebook, and they feel super connected. And this is not an original point at all, but, you know, I think that that contributes the feelings of isolation um, and when you're isolated then you don't feel like you've got any kind of purpose or meaning you could be sitting there taking in all this information but if you're not in a room with people you know like like we are now you know you can have a discussion it goes back and forward you know that's why it's so important I think to be able to come somewhere like Sweden or be stuck, stuck in a room and have to exchange ideas this this kind of thing happens um, less and less I think as people think they can do it online but you just can't 
Um, and so watching the groups that would get together every single week, you know, with a, the foot, whether it's the football group and they would do uh, lessons with the kids on like development or whatever, or the men who would get together and discuss whatever issues they had going on. I just think that was really interesting, making those connections in, in real life, human connection. Yeah, with some kind of common ground. So yes, yes. Yes. Um, just one final sort of point I want to well, question I want to ask you and make a maybe a point at the same time. Was um, the question was I wonder how was there much discussion of things like um, aggression and physicality, uh, things which are often so stereotypically m masculine features, which I'm not arguing that they are, but often these are things in the press that we see where people talk in popular culture as being sort of masculine features, um, being aggressive. And um, and then, so, so I was just curious as to whether that was something that came up at all. Um, and then, sort of connected to that, I was wondering what you think about um, ways in which um, things like physicality or aggression, I'm not sure these are the right words, uh, whether there are legitimate places for that or legitimate areas for that. Um, so maybe I can be clear about sort of thinking of a, an example. So certain sports are often create legitimate places for people to be thuggish or you know brutal. I mean, as a, as a, I think New Zealand rugby players often talk about. Um, there's a sort of phrase that they have, and lots of European rugby players traditionally would go to New Zealand to train, and then would come back and they'd find that their careers took off, and they, and they took off because the notion over there was. You can be a thug on the pitch and a gentleman off the pitch. And it's very much this sense of a little bit what John was referring to, this sort of gentlemanliness and sort of that sort of strand of Englishness off the pitch. But on the pitch was a sort of safe space for all sorts of things that people might or might not do. I mean, not personally one of those people who would be brave enough to throw myself in there. But I just wondered whether that was something that ever came up or was anything that's talked about. Um, um, yeah, um, I did ask specifically, I think it comes up quite a bit with the um, selection of men that I spoke to. I did ask them, do you think that violence, I think it was, do you think that violence is like inherently kind of connected to masculinity or not? And so that was really interesting because they all had different responses. Is that nature or nurture question? I don't think there's a solid answer. No, definitely not one that I would give as a woman. I'm just interested to see what they think. Um, and actually a lot of them did think that it was nurture. But, um, as Neil said, there was that point of wanting to be able to have all those sides, being able to have, you know, being strong and aggressive when needed, when needed, you know, being that protector. And I feel like all of the guys really wanted to have all, a multi, that, um, kind of that multifaceted um, exterior. But it was interesting because uh, when I started talking about this, when I say that it gets politicised, uh, masculinity, it feels like on the on the left, the discussion about masculinity is quite a, um, a weak one, right? So masculinity is all about being in touch with your feelings and being really vulnerable. And, you know, if you want to do that, fine. But I was finding it really difficult to find on the left that kind of case for being strong and aggressive as well. And, at the, and I do think there are points when you need to do that, you do to be strong. I mean, I think when you look at... When you look at the UK right now, it's like, oh my gosh, I wish that there were just more people that were a bit more... There's so much manipulation and there's so much kind of... I don't see any strong characters where you think this person's really principled or this person really stands for this. You know, I don't see strong people. You see, people might think, oh, Boris Johnson's really strong. I don't think he's, he's strong. Do you know what I mean? I don't see... And I think it's really important to have those um, types of men and women um but yeah so i'm sorry i feel like i've kind of gone off on a tangent there a little bit but um i do have people mention it and it is something that i'm fascinated by and having like i say having grown up in a super macho background my dad's algerian and i spent time living in latin america i've got ideas myself which i constantly have to challenge of how i think men should be <laughs> which you know has been part of this whole thing but I don't think there was a, a one particular answer it's in the third episode that we address that though so yeah I feel like I'm taking up so much of your time thank you so much for your contribution yeah.